afternoon, Howard Wig, Think Tech Hawaii Code Green. I am with the Hawaii State Energy Office, and my honorable guest today is a longtime friend, Lauren Roth Venu, and I might call her Ms. Water or Ms. Water Conservation for all of Hawaii. She's been in the water business for a long, long time and actually makes a good uh, living at it. I'm delighted to report. Uh, just to put two hats on her today, CEO of 3R Water, which we will be discussing, and then also CEO of Roth Environmental, no, Ecological Design, which she's uh, had forever. And we know that climate change is coming and maybe something that she hasn't considered is that one of her many programs encourages the landscaping such that the water seeps into the ground instead of running off and going down the, the storm drain. I uh, am a perfect example myself. I live in Upper Manoa, very, very wet. And after a heavy rain, down my driveway comes just a teeny little trickle of water, whereas my neighbor, we have side-by-side uh, -side driveways, he has paved over a heck of a lot of his property and there is just a waterfall gushing down his driveway and into the storm drain. Question, what if he absorbed as much water as my property does and multiply that by 10,000, wouldn't you have even greener, even lusher Hawaii on our hands and we'd have a nice full uh, water table. Right now, we're all lush and green. I was just out on the Waianae coast. All that area is lush and green right now. That ain't going to happen forever. We will have a drought. We are going to have other emergencies. And here to semi-rescue us, at least from a water standpoint, is uh, Lauren Roth Venu. And Lauren, why don't you start? She, she's doing all these great things. Why don't you start by telling us the, the program that you're working in con concert with the, the city about. Sure, and, uh, thank you so much, Howard, for having me on. Again, um, mm -hmm. I, always good to see you um, and, and happy to share with you some of the updates on some of the work we've been working mm -hmm. on. Um, so, I, you know, I, I don't know if it makes sense now to go through the, some of the slides and I can kind of, I think it, it'll give a a good basis of what we're doing now with 3R Water and with the city and county of Honolulu. Um, but as you mentioned, stormwater runoff is um, is a huge deal, like not just here in Hawaii, but this is really becoming a global issue in many cities as, as these cities prepare for um, the effects of, of, of climate change. And, um, and, and stormwater does, you know, we can talk about a little bit about that, but as people might be aware and how you just mentioned, um, you know, essentially, if when you can't get water back into the ground, that can impact future supply. Um, and so, the more we have, more urbanization we have, um, the more the likelihood of that of water when it rains getting back into the ground gets diminished. So, um, green infrastructure um, is a method that the the city and county of Honolulu uh, recognizes for for sustainable water management, as well as many cities across the U.S. But essentially, what it does is it peels back some of that urban hardscape. And you begin to implement things like, you know, rain gardens and bioretention, or even, um, you know, uh, parking lots that have permeable pavement or rainwater harvesting systems. And what that does is it captures that stormwater, retains it, um, infiltrates it, or if you have a cistern, you can then, of course, reuse that water. And so, um, new developments or redevelopments across the city, um, when they're greater than one acre, have to implement green infrastructure that already exists in the rules. But then the question becomes now we have so much existing development that you know really has the biggest impact. So um, we can talk a little bit about it and you kind of brought it up, but the city has been working on uh, the, the potential and feasibility of implementing what's called a stormwater utility. And so these stormwater utilities in essence impose fees on all properties based on the amount of impervious area you have. So that means the more the more hardscape like roofs and parking lots and so forth, the more you pay. And then with that, 
you can be incentivized to reduce that hardscape um, by implementing these green infrastructure practices and then get a reduction potentially in your bill. So these stormwater utilities are um, in like 2000 plus locations across the United States and, and, and continuing to grow also in nine countries. Um, and really this is a response to the fact that most cities um, drainage networks were just not designed for this many people and this intense frequent of storms. And so this is a way to get a dedicated fund essentially to update the drainage infrastructure and get more green infrastructure projects out in the community to really be a top down and bottom up, bottom up solution to address um, uh, the needs, especially with climate change. Um, and can you, Lauren, can you define hardscape and pervious? Yes, absolutely. So, so when I say hardscape, um, I would say things like things like with concrete surfaces, where essentially when when the when it does rain, the water cannot get through um, that material. So that would be things like when it you know when the rain hits a roof, for example, um, it's 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 not going to penetrate into the ground at that building footprint. Um, or if you have a, a parking lot with asphalt, a typical asphalt or typical concrete. When the rain hits that surface, it's not going to be able to penetrate down through that material. So, um, those that's considered impervious, meaning like you, it's not a permeable. You cannot get water through that material. Um, and then on the opposite side, um, when we say we want permeable or pervious surfaces, that means then we want um, that rainwater is then able to infiltrate through that material and get into the ground. Um, and again, that's like acting like a, we, we think of the, the ground as acting like a sponge. So when it rains, that rainwater can fill up, fill in that sponge, and then that slowly percolates and, and um, you know, builds up our underlying aquifers and groundwater. Um, but when it hits hard surface, it doesn't have the ability to do that. And it goes directly into our city drainage networks, and then directly um, then into streams and oceans. And it's, in some sense, it's, you know, lost water every time it rains. And we don't want to have lost water by by any means. Yeah, and and I mean, then going back to that drainage infrastructure, it's not designed uh, for you know large volumes going in, and that's where we could get ourselves into trouble with more hard surfaces and more intense, frequent storms. Those two combinations um, mm -hmm. could be really um, really hard on on for us in our city. We're, we are one of the cities that are vulnerable to these. Um, impacts with um, more urbanization, climate change, with more heavy storms, um, and this is this is not unique to Hawaii. This is this is happening in a lot of locations uh, across yeah. the globe. Yeah, some somehow the uh, geographic locations of Houston and Louisiana come to mind immediately. Absolutely, yeah. and I, I actually <laughs> just um, through their office of of climate change and resiliency, they. Um, they are able now to, uh, they're, they're going to be creating incentive programs in a place like Houston where, um, where properties can basically apply for grants um, and, get, and get these get, get typical community projects and put out millions of dollars to basically get it back out into um, you know, both for residential and commercial properties and priority areas to hopefully build back that sponge, especially as mm -hmm. you can imagine, these areas are very susceptible to storms. Very susceptible, yeah. Yeah. And then come to think of it also, uh, what comes to mind is rivers. When rivers, you put all the stormwater into rivers, then the rivers overflow and destroy property and so forth, so forth. Exactly. Yep. So then that's, and that's typically what, as if people aren't aware, you know, they're, you know, you basically, when you have a city drainage network, which, which we, the water goes into the, the storm sewer. Now in, in Hawaii, we have separate um, <laughs> wastewater sewers. That's different versus our stormwater sewers, which, mm -hmm. um, but when, the, when it does rain, the water flows off that driveway or flows off um, the road and it goes into, um, you know, an area where it collects and into the pipes. And, you know, those, those systems, the city is required to, tr you know, maintain and try to um, keep that water clean. Um, but the more we have of the stormwater going in, the harder it is to do that. But the point is, is there's a water quality issue that happens too when it goes directly then into that pipe system and then into our, our streams here in Hawaii, um, which then will cause the streams to fill up and potentially overflow. Um, but then also we have, you know, manage the pollution issues as well. Yep, all of that. Uh, speaking of which, how does this all tie into the fact that we have at last the new plumbing code? 
Yeah, so, right, that's a great question, Howard. So, um, uh, I was thrilled to hear that we, as a, the city and county of Honolulu, and uh, is adopted the UPC 2012, um, which includes the being... oh, sorry, the uh, the Uniform Plumbing Code. Um, mm -hmm. And so, with that, and I believe it's Chapter 16, it has provisions for the reuse of non-potable water back inside. Uh, buildings for non-potable end uses. So when, so when we talk about potable versus non-potable, mm -hmm. potable water is that, that, that the highest quality drinking water that you would you basically are ingesting. Non-potable is um, things like, you know, would not be used for drinking water, but is still perfectly good water for things like flushing toilets, for irrigation, um, you know, potentially for makeup water, for cooling towers, fire suppression, water features. And so we commonly actually do that in Hawaii, um, not necessarily in the building, but we have like a recycled water program here. You see purple pipes, that's, that's considered non-potable water and it's being used for non-potable end uses. Now, most commonly we see that at golf courses, for example, um, today. Um, what, mm -hmm. what this plumbing code does is it allows now us, or now as developers to um, basically capture water on property that could be something like rainwater harvested from the building roof. So that's a stormwater piece um, and or things like treated gray water and black water to create R1 water um, that could be basically reused back inside the buildings for things like, again, toilet flushing, um, mm -hmm. cooling tower makeup water. Because in the urban spaces, there's not really much irrigation to be had. Because uh, as we were talking about, we have all this this hardscape or a lot of it's, you know, um, you know, highly urbanized. So the real way we can maximize um, the reuse of water, capture and use of water and minimize that, you know, bigger water footprint is actually to use it within the structures themselves. So the plumbing code is um, definitely a key component for that. And, uh, and then the stormwater piece is important because, you know, if we can capture that rainwater off of the building, building roofs, you know, store it, and then you know that helps prevent the, the flooding issues, potential flooding, localized flooding issues. Um, it also provides a water conservation measure. Um, so there's a lot of positivity for doing that, and now being able to use that water in a in a more beneficial way um, back inside buildings is really, I think, going to be a great driver for how we think about how we design our urban core. Am I mistaken, or did Punahou School in its rebuilding implement uh, measures like that? They did, I don't believe that they did the dual plumbing because at the time, I believe that the, the, the plumbing code only got passed in August, I believe of this mm, year. Yeah. So um, so if there was prior um, installations of rainwater harvesting, I think they use that to support their a water feature as well as yeah. irrigation. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but it's, it's great to see that schools are doing that, especially I think it's so important for the kids to, to mm -hmm. learn about these practices um, and, uh, and, not to derail, but when we in talking about the, the mobile application three R water developed, um, it was called Follow the Drop, and um, or it is still called Follow the Drop. Um, we we received funding from the State of Hawaii Water um, Water Security Advisory Group, which was managed by DLNR, as well as the Hawaii Community Foundation, to, to really develop the first working uh, prototype of the app. And we partnered with Kupu, and we actually ran it in schools to start because we thought. You know, we want to create this uh, a mobile app and an education effort that you know um, Hawaii's kids can get involved in and begin to really understand like what are the challenges we're having in our water resources here locally, what's the challenges we have in infrastructure, and then importantly give them solutions like green infrastructure, like rain gardens and catchment tanks and so forth mm -hmm. that they can then go around and and essentially using the mobile app can identify opportunities of where and how much stormwater is being generated. Um, opportunities to implement these green infrastructure projects. Mm -hmm. um, and then essentially through that initial grant, we actually were able to get um, a, a few of those schools um, some projects or get, get their rain gardens actually installed for them as part of their um, their overall class effort. So I'm always, I, I love it when, you know, we can really get the kids involved. I think it's, it's super important because mm -hmm. this is really their future that we're talking about. Um, infrastructure takes a, a long time to get get right and get set it's probably constantly evolving but certainly um, when we kind of set up what the future of, of water management is going to look like it's, it's certainly um, it'll be our kids today that are going to be yeah, you know inheriting yeah. um, inheriting what we're putting in now 
Yeah, and Lord knows they they've got to do a better job, just in general than than we're doing. Yeah, and just getting them to think about for these issues at a young age, you know. Um, and mm -hmm. so this was like a design thinking curriculum kind of got developed around this program um, to really have them critically think about these issues and importantly give them some solutions. But um, I think it's important to, to begin the conversation early. I mean, this was this was a you know group Absolutely. of fifth graders, you know, so. And they, they can continue to have that knowledge and, and work on solutions in all types of ways to build more resilient communities as they you know, go through school. So, And, and this is hands-on. This is outdoors, hands-on, real stuff. And that's the way that we human beings learned for millennia for, from the beginning of our, of our species. It's only in the last couple hundred yeah. years that we were sitting around uh, reading books and scratching on pieces of paper or, now uh, typing on computers. Absolutely, yeah, no, absolutely. I Outdoors think it's, and showing them what's going on here. Absolutely, and of course, and, and kids learn differently. Some kids learn by doing with their hands and some kids are more cerebral, but so giving the opportunity to do both and, and kind of maximize mm -hmm. the way that they can learn um, important issues like, like climate change and building resilient communities, I think is, is, is great. So yeah, that was a really great program. We, we finished that up. Um, uh, in 20, was it 20, 2019. Um, and then what happened was we, once we had the, you know, we were working with the city and county of Honolulu, they were interested on some of the education pieces too. But then um, basically as they were starting to develop their stormwater utility, I think it occurred to um, both of us, that, like meaning uh, 3R and, and the city that how it could be used to support their community engagement piece, as well as uh, potentially being the method of which um, you know, different property owners could submit projects for fee credits or rebates once the stormwater utility would go out. So that's kind of where we are right now. And so what it, what it means um, is that essentially the app can help, it, when we license the software to the city, they can distribute it for free for every you know, person um, on Oahu to use. And what we'll do is if you, Howard, were, were one of the users, you would be um, prompted to take a photo of some kind of drainage device, let's say on your property, like a downspout. Um, and when you take that photo, it, it'll uh, bring you into your location through the, through the software, just like um, the drop pin does in Maps. And then it'll prompt you to select an image of what you're looking at. So it, it'll have a little uh, icon of a downspout that if you don't know what, what it is you're looking at exactly, it'll show you the different things to, to try to identify. So you can select in this case the downspout. Um, it, it will then prompt you to then draw with your finger um, the area of your, the roof that you think you're capturing from that downspout. And then we pull in all the rain gauge network across um, the city. And because of your geolocation, we can tell you, okay, your that your annual rainfall is, is 40 inches or, or a year or what have you. So with that information of the drainage area and the rainfall, we now produce a bar graph that this downspout is outputting you know, 50,000 gallons of, of rainwater annually. Um, and then it then provides you different options of solutions. So you can select, you know, a rain garden or rainwater catchment. We're gonna be adding in permeable pavement and it'll provide you optimum sizing for each one of those solutions. Mm. Um, and then with this, with the city, we're doing a pilot, you know, where we would be linking in, seeing how we could link in to the customer billing database. And what we'll do is be able to say, by you putting in whatever um, size and type system that you're putting into the app, it'll show you your potential monthly or annual fee credit or discount you would get. And so then through the app, you would submit um, the project. And so when you submit the project, the city then receives it on the back end. They could see all the users that are um, submitting projects. And then the city is then able to review these projects and then you know get you know, be able from there be able to to qualify them for a potential fee credit or rebate or even grant if it ends up becoming the case. And then also in the back end they can track you know locations and status of these projects like you know what timestamp when they were installed are they being maintained that kind of a thing which is really critical um, as well as providing metrics that they can use. Um, Hopefully, it be supported for compliance purposes that they have to meet with for state and um, that federal compliance for having an MS4 program or NPDES. Um, but then also, what's important is those metrics could be used for our um, resiliency measurements. So we can see how much stormwater we are collectively as a community um, capturing and infiltrating 
um, and, 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 these, and these around the island. So, so there's all different kinds of ways the data can be used, but that's essentially um, how the product works. Beautiful. And I believe maybe you have some uh, slides to back all this up. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I, I've introduced 3R Water, but yeah, in essence, mm -hmm. you know, our, our goal and mission is really just to build water security and resiliency through technology. So, um, you know, don't want to get into too much background, but, but you know, as Howard mentioned, you know, you, you know, I've been in the water sector now close to 20 years with my own design firm for 16 years. And this really came out of an effort. I'm not sure if folks know too much about the Hawaii Fresh Water Initiative. Um, but essentially, the, the Hawaii Fresh Water Initiative um, was an effort to basically meet state water security goals um, by the year 2030 by implementing practices like capturing stormwater. And so through my design efforts, we've, I've been involved in integrated water resource planning and green infrastructure design. And this really came out of an effort to say, like, we, we wanted to go out to our commercial clients and say, like, here, how can we quickly find opportunities for you to implement practices that would that would meet the goals of the fresh water initiative and then specifically this ended up focusing on on stormwater so anyway you can go back to the slide i just want to give a little premise of how it came to be so we we talked about this briefly but i mean the issue really that we're seeing with stormwater um, the problems that we're really addressing is that with more mm -hmm. urbanization and more frequent intense storms the likelihood of of flooding is, increases and also the likelihood of more pollution or waterways also increases. And then, then on the flip side of that, it, you know, when we have more hard surfaces, we can't get that water back in the ground. So now we're, stormwater runoff when we get it going into pipes can also mean impacting future supply. So you can go next slide. Um, and then of course we talked about the climate change. So basically this has been now the real driver. Um, you can go ahead next slide, Haley. And so here again is really what these cities are trying to promote. They're trying to promote um, green infrastructure as a solution to address that flooding pollution and future water supplies. So these green infrastructure practices um, that we, you know, permeable pavement, uh, green gardens, especially the green, green side of things also have all these positive things like reducing uh, heat island effects, for example. You know, the more green space you put back in, there's a cooling factor, um, absorbing CO2. Um, you know, helping restore uh, the natural hydrology, building biodiversity. So there's a whole host of other things that are positive with green infrastructure beyond just stormwater. Okay. And can you explain those, uh, those photos look slightly different one from another. Can you explain that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, no, absolutely. So yeah, yeah the, the top one is a, is, a, is a cistern system. So it's capturing that rainwater from a building roof and putting it into a tank. Um, and then mm -hmm. of course, with that, with that water, you could, um, use it uh, at another time. Uh, the bottom one is uh, would be a uh, what's called a rain garden or bioretention, and it's taking the stormwater here from a walkway, or this could be from a street. It could also be from the downspout of a building, and putting it into this engineered, um, you know, rain garden that basically then captures that stormwater, stores it, filters it, and then infiltrates it back into the ground. So that's just a couple examples of a, a few, two different green infrastructure practices. Um, so, so basically, like I mentioned, you know, follow the drop was really developed to be a bottom up and top down solution to get more green infrastructure up, out into urban spaces. So we found that there's just not the, the first of all, on the one side there, you know, getting the community involved is, is highly important for us to really build resiliency. We can't just rely on the city to try to upgrade our drainage network for the 100 year storm, it just would be cost prohibitive. So we need to start you know, creating more sponges in the city and this is a mechanism we can motivate people to do so, especially with stormwater utilities uh, where they exist. You can go to next slide. And so this is just a, a little um, diagram showing some of the interfaces and some of the things that it supports. So um, as you can see in that little rain cloud that represents essentially, essentially that we bring in the rain, existing rain gauge network of, um, of, of gauges that are out there. We bring it into the app um, through that photo in this example of that downspout, we are then able to calculate, um, we'll, we'll be able to know the annual rainfall. The, that second uh, image on the, uh, moving from the left um, is, is a, the, the, where you can draw with your finger the drainage area of that roof going to that downspout. Um, so using that, those two information, we're able to get bar graphs, as I mentioned, of stormwater runoff. You can implement the projects. Um, 
It also supports you know, the city and a whole host of other things. So on the right-hand side, you're seeing the administrator viewpoint where it shows the maps of where these projects are located, tracking the volumes um, and how much stormwater is being captured through these green infrastructure projects. Um, and so then again, it provides that data metrics, a little bit of asset management, um, but importantly, really getting that community engagement. So again, you, using the app, you can then install or you could, you could submit your projects for a potential fee credit or rebate with these municipalities. Um, you can jump through this. This was the pilot that we did. These are just all the partners um, when we first made the app. A bunch of great community, community partners. You can go next slide. Um, and then just, just a little bit of a diagram again, how it works. Um, you know, we, we basically provide a license to the city stormwater agencies. Um, the property owners then can submit projects through the app. And then essentially the stormwater utilities can, re can review these projects for fee credits, rebates, and give that back to the property owner. Quickly, the next slide, I'll just um, do a real quick. So basically we're doing a pilot right now with the city and county of Honolulu. Um, we're doing a one water approach, including the Board of Water Supply in this discussion. We're gonna update the, the existing um, mobile app to match the city incentive program. And, um, and then importantly, we're running this with Malama, Mount Alua, the test region will be Aina Haina. And so again, depending on how COVID is really gonna wow. go forward, we were, it'll be by um, appointment or, um, or, or door to door again next summer, essentially to get folks involved um, using the app and getting surveys and feedback on what, what, what it would take or what additional incentives mm -hmm. they might need to actually install these projects. So, wow. Yeah. That's really impressive. Yeah, wow. thanks. It's, it's, we're excited. We're, we're really excited to um, have the opportunity to, to work with the city on this and um, wow. we're hoping for good things mm -hmm. to come out of it. And in the 30 seconds we have left, what if people want some follow-up information on this? Sure. Um, I mean, if they can go to 3R Water website, which is www.3r-water.com. Um, and hopefully we'll have some updates there. They can also go to the city's stormwater utility website, which is, I believe, uh, stormwaterutilityoahu.org. Um, mm -hmm. storm yes, I might have that wrong, but they're, I, I'm close, yeah, well. close enough. Um, and they'll, they can learn more about uh, what the city has been preparing and they've been, how they've been going out to the neighborhood boards, all the presentations are there, a bunch of information about um, uh, that program is on their website. It sounds like Honolulu is one of the leading cities in the entire nation in, in this uh, initiative. Yeah, Maybe no, sir. There's sir. another handful of cities we're partnering with there. Um, we are starting to work and talk with some other cities um, to match mm -hmm. a pilot, doing some more pilots in the U.S. Um, certainly, Honolulu is doing a lot of things right. And so, one of, I'm, you know, really, I think we are pushing the envelope on how we bring, come bring people together as a community across our agencies to really move forward in a collective way, which is, I think, the only way forward if we're going to, you know, really build resilience Absolutely, yeah. um, anywhere. Yeah. So I think we do an excellent job doing that. And on that very cheery note, we must uh, bid fond adieu. Lauren Roth, Venu, thank you so much. Great seeing you again. And you were doing great things before. You're de doing bigger and better things now. So thank you very much. Signing off for Think Tech Hawaii Code Green. See you next time.